It's spooky season, and just in time, a new fossil mummy has been described coming from Edmontosaurus. Edmontosaurus is known to have a few fossil mummies, however, not all dinosaur mummies are created equally, and the new juvenile Edmontosaurus has new positions of the skin preserved, including at very small scales within the scales, some of which were only 3 to 4 millimeters in width. This is also particularly true at the base of the neck, where it is preserved as a 1 100th inch thin layer of clay created by bacteria, which fix the clay particles in place on the surface of the skin, being able to preserve such fine details. Importantly though, down the rest of the back, it shows that there was a large fleshy crest running down that back. But there's more. Another fossil from the so-called mummy zone of the Lance Formation actually has spikes preserved along parts of the tail and potentially all the way up into parts of that crest. They're not super pointy spikes, however they are very similar to one modern lizard, Gonocephalus doriae, or Doria's angle-headed lizard, which has interlocking spikes, I meaning essentially there's little folds on the back of each one of these spikes on its back so that they can form a more sturdy structure. Which is really interesting that this animal that is many, many times heavier than Doria's angle-headed lizard would have had basically the same kind of structure in its tail. The site is interpreted as a drought-induced assemblage, and that these Edmontosaurus and a Tyrannosaurus that was also found in the area but hasn't been published on yet came together to a water feature, and seemingly they died because of dehydration before the rains hit. But only just beforehand, as when the rains came, they were able to bury these fossils with the skin still attached very rapidly. And then the clay and mud that was transported by those rains covered them, and the decay which started allowed for this sort of preservation. This is in contrast to the Drumheller et al. 2022 paper, which looked at the Dakota specimen. And I say that because the Dakota specimen seemingly was actually exposed for a good while. However, as it was exposed, it was fed upon by crocodilians. That allowed insects to enter the body cavity, and basically their larvae ate everything except for the skin. And then the skin was able to stick back onto the bone, and as it got buried later, it was able to stay with that preserved skin. That said, we don't have a ton of information on the taphonomy and essentially what happened after the animals died for this site, and I do have concerns because of that about the crest on the back, as during decay it is possible that the skin just became entirely detached from the rest of the body, and during burial it may have slid slightly. That would have given it a more extended impression of the skin extending higher than the neural spines, which may not be the case. Hard to know right now, we would need a few more fossils to really test that. However, there are things that are in common with the Dakota specimen, like the preservation of the hooves. And I'm saying that loosely because it is very similar to what we see in things like horses, for example, but not perfectly identical. Specifically, there is a structure similar to the frog of a horse, which is this V down the middle of the toe. And horses run on only one toe, these animals still would have run on three toes. And that's actually pretty similar to horse relatives like the tapirs. Shout out to my friend Will, who's actually studying tapirs. This kind of foot shape was compared with the largest hadrosaur prints from the latest Cretaceous, and the shape suggests that the rounded toes of large Ornithischian dinosaurs are actually linked to hoof evolution. And that means that A, when it first started to show up in things that would lead to things like Edmontosaurus, it would actually would have been in things like Iguanodon, some of the first ornithopods, that may be able to achieve very large sizes. However, even before that, in the earlier Middle Jurassic, the Thyreophorans probably evolved basically the same thing themselves, the Thyreophorans being things like the Ankylosaurs and the Stegosaurs. And this is really interesting, because small ornithopods don't have this kind of toe shape, meaning that this kind of hoof shape evolved convergently in multiple Ornithischian groups. So what does this mean? Well, basically we have a new mummy, and because of some of the traits, for example, those scales being so small, we can still learn more about it. And that's even if the skin did slide slightly. And when I talk about that, what I'm talking about is there are these little grooves in the crest that would have been on the back. And in certain parts of it, there's little folds in there, and those have finer scales, meaning it's true to the original shape that it would have had. What that means is essentially we can say, hey, these little folds are linked to the flexibility of the animal, so that its skin wouldn't pull as tightly when it was rotating. And what that means is, we can see better about how its behavior and locomotion would have been.